if you are doing a film that you've got to achieve a retro look for, really any film, the production design is paramount. I'm Chris Hillicky. I'm the director of photography for Third Saturday in October and Third Saturday in October Part 5, which are two slasher films that are supposedly a lost slasher film franchise that started in 1979. I wanted to make this video for you guys to kind of show you a little behind the scenes of what went into getting the look that we did specifically for third Saturday in October, the first one, which is set in 1979. This movie is directed by one of my best friends, Jay Burleson. He and I met at Sidewalk Film Festival, and if you are ever looking for reasons to go to film festivals, I would say that's one of the main ones, is that you can meet incredible, like-minded folks at a film festival, and I mean, I met one of my best friends there. Stop it! <laughs> I think really the answer to how we achieved the retro look was that Jay pulled together a team of people all focused on different areas of, of making that happen and we coordinated well enough to pull something off that I think is fairly convincing. If you are doing a film that you've got to achieve a retro look for, really any film the production design is paramount, and I find that a lot of times cinematographers will get credit for things that really probably the production designers should be getting credit for. So for all you production designers out there, my hat that I'm not wearing is off to you, my friends. There's all these departments, all these team members putting forth their best effort to tell your story. And they're putting all that stuff in front of a lens. And it gets turned into photons and goes through that glass to the film plane or to the sensor and the camera. And that's the first gatekeeper of what your look is, is the glass. Jay knew he wanted to have active zooms because we were going for a 70s aesthetic. So I knew, okay, we, we need a parfocal zoom. And, you know, if we're going for a 70s aesthetic, let's get a lens that's, you know, a 70s lens. I think choosing the Ingenue 15 to 150 millimeter um, was the first step in a series of decisions that kept us consistent with the 1979 look. It just renders things in a very pleasing way and it feels authentic because it kind of is authentic as a piece of glass for that period. We used um, the Switar lenses, the little turret lenses that come with the Bullocks. We had a 75 and we had a 25. They're like little C-mount lenses that we put on there. The 25 we used for an establishing shot. and I think we might have used it on Denver's dancing scene and on a car mount shot with Heather. Doing little things like that, getting that actual retro glass in there, those little things sprinkle throughout the film and they kind of, you know, have a subconscious effect and just kind of help sell it to you a little bit more. So this is a Bronco Burger and we're shooting at night, trying to make it look like daytime. In here, we have the partly cloudy look, I call it. But what it is, is it's a couple of Aperture 300Xs with toppers, the cuts that are with Fresnel kind of spotted in. See, it's nighttime, but we're trying to make it feel like there's a bunch of light coming in through these windows. So we have a Nova with an egg crate. Then we've got another Nova playing through this diffusion right here. And it's just kind of an ambient fill to this area where a lot of action is going to be happening. I think my schooling, which was in the 90s, around filmmaking was very helpful when coming up with how to film the Third Saturday movie because I learned using textbooks from the 70s. All the way I thought as a film student still plays and the people I learned coming up they were filmmakers in the 70s, and a lot of the films that I love are from the 70s. So it wasn't a stretch for me to put my brain there. And I think that helps if you're working on a retro piece to try to get your mindset 
adjacent to the mindset of the filmmakers you're referencing. One of the references Jay and I had for Third Saturday in October was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And particularly the moonlight in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's a very blue kind of moonlight. And I think this speaks to that tungsten versus daylight um, mindset that I used to have with when shooting film. If you're shooting on tungsten film, night exterior, and you put a full blue gel on a tungsten light, that's moonlight. <laughs> it's blue. That was the frame of mind that I went into Third Saturday with. Now, with modern stuff, a lot of times we'll add in a little green, uh, kind of try to do some things differently to kind of get a silvery kind of uh, moonlight. But, you know, when they were doing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they went full blue and then some. I mean, the, the moonlight in that movie is very blue. So we wanted to do that. And that's kind of what you see with some of the nighttime exterior stuff. And the lighting is super important. You know, there's a lot of things that you can look at when you start studying the history of film and you start breaking down imagery from previous work. You've got less sensitive film stocks. You're shooting at 25T. You know, you're you're down at 50 daylight. You know, you're, you're, you need photons. You need lots of photons, but you don't have a lot of money to get really big lights and then break them up and soften them. So you're just having to point medium lights you know at your subject without softening it at all so y y y that's where these harder you know out of necessity they're just going to be harder shadows harder light sometimes 100 watt light bulb with black wrap can do so much put a dimmer on it and you can warm it up you can you know dial it down um and turn it on and off real fast, flicker it, all that kind of stuff. They're tiny, they're lightweight. You can clamp them into corners and hide them in the ceiling and put them on the end of a stick. And that's the light that I learned how to light with when I was doing VHS movies in the 90s. Everybody had some 100 watt light bulb scoop lamps in their garage, you know, that you could go grab and just get a bunch of those and poke them around and point them at things and light it so you can see it, you know. So this is what we got. We got this jib going here. Uh... Got a little camera. The pocket jib. Right, right. This is Sean. He's the man. Yeah. He's got the plan. We got some moonlight happening right there. Yeah, we, got some... we had a moonlight key light. We had a headlight gag that was playing on the house to bring out color contrast. But I forgot that there was a car right next to the scene until the actors were ready to go and realized we needed to add a light real quickly. Luckily, the gaffer, Chad, already had a good run of electricity to the front of the house with a cube tap ready to go so it was very easy to add that light at the last minute which was something i had forgotten and it changed the entire dynamic of the scene because it adds a warm key light that contrasts the moonlight sometimes it's like right before you go that you come up with an idea that's like oh man this makes sense and it can really make the scene come alive Early on, you know, you're kind of coming up with all your rules. And once you establish your rules, you're like, okay, we're shooting. We're not going to shoot on modern glass. Modern glass is out of the question. We're going to shoot on a camera with a small sensor that's nearest to 16 millimeter that we can. So the depth of field matches. Um, we're going to use a zoom lens that has parfocal focus so that we can do active zooming as an aesthetic. We're going to do full blue moonlight and actually make it even more blue to kind of mimic that Texas Chainsaw Massacre moonlight. Harder light is okay. You know, you can get away with harder light in certain scenes. You don't have to make it all pretty and soft like a modern movie. And you, you get going and you start shooting and you're real meticulous about like, okay, did we do it? Is it there? But once you establish it and you start shooting and a week goes by, you kind of go, ah, all right, this is it. And then you're just making a movie. Okay, thank you. We are here on the um, location for third Saturday in October, part one. We've got a cam mate right here. He's got pan tilt control and such. So lighting, we got a lot of dirt because all our stands are fully deployed up. So that's bouncing off that foam core and then you can see the lamps 
they're all shooting up in the car. So that's a 600D and two 300Ds with for nails. The crane brings the camera out to here and we watch as the sheriff gets out of this vehicle. He gets out. And if you look behind us up here, there's a sodium vapor light and street light. And it's casting the shadow of the uh, crane onto the car. So what we've done is we've taken a four by floppy right here. And you can see that that's taking that light away. We're replacing exposure with this 100 watt bulb on a scoop and a dimmer so that we can control it to taste. So it's not too sore, so you just fill it. It's just to get some color on there. At the end of the day, every team member is trying to do their best work and make the vision come alive as best it can be. And that's the culture of film that I love. It's just like this raw determination to make your dream come alive, you know? And, and that was what we had on the third Saturday movies, both part one and part five. I hope you've gotten something out of watching the behind the scenes look at us pulling these movies off and gotten some ideas for your own projects. And uh, thanks to Film Courage for letting us get the word out. Take care.